help fill pools for elephants to play in. And I did this as my job. Well, I kind of did it as my job. I volunteered at zoos and aquariums for many years, including during college. In college, I studied environmental science with a focus on the conservation of endangered species and how conservation efforts are at the forefront now of zoos and aquariums, and they're not just for profits anymore. Despite what you may have seen or heard on the news or in documentaries, zoos and aquariums play a vital role in preserving fragile ecosystems. In order to understand the importance of zoos and aquariums, in modern society, we must first understand the conservation programs they implement and how they benefit the captive animals' wildlife counterparts. By understanding the impending extinction crisis, conservation efforts, and inner workings of zoos and aquariums, we can begin to understand the importance of zoos and aquariums in modern society. It's important for us to see why and when zoos and aquariums began shifting their missions and goal statements toward more, towards a more conservation-focused approach rather than for profits or for entertainment. Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with the 2013 documentary, Blackfish. The documentary showed their predecessor to SeaWorld, which was marine land of the Pacific. They began capturing wild orcas in the 1960s. The documentary states that these animals were put on display, used in shows, and kept in small pools. This led people to begin viewing zoos and aquariums as harmful to animals, animals rather than preserving them. No matter what side of the debate you stand on, the documentary led the shifts for most zoos and aquariums to become more vocal and upfront about their conservation efforts. SeaWorld was not one of the only establishments doing this. Other sanctuaries and zoos and aquariums also began to focus their messages on conservation, recycling, climate change, and more and extinction. Now you might notice when visiting your local zoo or aquarium that the placards on the exhibits discuss the animal's potential for extinction in the wildlife and it's usually based on a scale and any efforts being done to preserve those animals. Extinction is a, it's a huge but quiet underlying reason for zoos and aquariums in existence. Every zoo or aquarium that I've ever worked at and made sure that we knew that the animal we were working with, we knew where they stood on the extinction scale and what we were doing to combat the problem. At the seventh century, seventh session of the IPBS plenary session in Paris in 2019, Yoon reported that the rate of extinction and decline was unprecedented, unprecedented, and that one of the main contributing factors was indeed humans. Now, I'm sure we've all heard of the rhino crisis at some point and the decline of the population. How many rhinos do you think are left in the world? According to the World Wildlife Fund's website, in the 1950s there was 500,000 rhinos left in the wild. Today there are only 27,000. One major program being utilized to combat the problem of extinction is the Species Survival Plan, or the SSP. At San Diego Zoo here in California, they are one of the most successful plans of using the SSP for the rhinos. They boast that their program successfully bred over 90 calves. Unfortunately, the population was no longer self-sustaining and the program did come to an end. The last two northern white rhinos live in Kenya under 24-hour surveillance. All accredited zoos and aquariums, also known as AZAs, undergo strict licensing requirements and it's one of the highest regulated programs in the nation. Now, the uh, SSP, Species Survival Plan, is an intricate system of breeding captive animals in hopes of one day increasing the animals' numbers in the wild as well. This program is not just for rhinos, but has also been successfully used for polar bears, pandas, and smaller creatures such as bugs and frogs. While this program may be the most obvious one to guess, is there are a lot of underlying, more subliminal ones that encourage guests to go home and better the world and the natural world around them. We can look at some of the other ways that they encourage people to better their daily lives as to help the captive animals well. wildlife counterpart. Most of the zoos and aquariums now have a program that focuses not only on conservation animals but the planet as well. Many will emphasize the importance of properly recycling materials, composting methods, or how to even grow your own food. Another way zoos have restructured is that they influence the attitude of their guests to alter their daily lives to improve the natural environment. Zoos and aquariums tend to be located in highly densely populated areas where people may otherwise not be able to see these animals or experience them. And by having these zoos and aquariums, it encourages people to think outside of the realm of their city. These establishments also act as mentors to future generations by encouraging guests from young age to better the planet, become scientists, and focus on the ways they can positively affect the world around them. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to zoos and aquariums, and it's normal for a lot of people to simply see these, these places as cages and houses for animals. 
However, understanding why we have these thoughts is one of the ways we can begin to alter our outlook, our outlook towards these establishments. It's important to not only recognize humans as part of the problem, but recognize them as part of the solution as well. Susan aquariums have come a long way from the days when they were used for entertainment. And while there's still a lot of work to be done, they, we can, there's no denying that they have improved tremendously. So next time we visit a zoo, look past the animals, read the signs, engage, ask what efforts are being made to help conserve not only animals in care, but in the wild as well. I'm sure somebody there living their childhood dream would be more than happy to tell you.